Today, we're going to be responding to the Truth Hurts video on Noah's Ark and whether it does disprove the entire Bible. I'm going to be talking about his arguments, reasoning he provides, and see whether it does lead to a complete disproof of Christianity. Let's get right into it. Despite growing up with a picture of Noah's Ark on my bedroom wall, I would go 25 years of my life without ever studying the story's historicity. That was until one particular day when my dad recommended that for my next public talk, I take a look at the outline, the flood of Noah's day has meaning for us. A talk in which the number one objective is to convince the audience that the flood was a real historical event. Process. A process of which optimism turned to scepticism, turned to mental despair. How through isolating and dissecting just one Bible story, sent the infallibility of the entire Bible crashing down. Now, it's a very interesting thing that the first thing he says is, the top title is, how does Noah's Ark story have meaning for us? And then his conclusion, or the first thing he's meant to prove, is the historicity of Noah's Ark. Well, that is not exactly the way Christians have historically gone around doing whether a story has a meaning for us. In fact, most people would look at a story and first go, it's like, what is the significance of this story? What are the meanings? What are the symbologies found within this story? And then thus then look at the historical data if that is necessary in the future. That's what Origen has done. That's what Augustine has done. And a lot of Christians throughout history in the early church towards the modern day as well. But I think it's important to clarify and distinguish between the historical meaning and also the symbolic meaning. And it's possible, and I'll develop this later on in the video relating to what he's saying, but to separate the two such that even if it's not historically true, the, the story can still have meaning for us, great significance for us, without disproving the entire Bible at all. So that's an important thing I want to get out to start with. Pressing COVID is no longer a Say this at a club, I think. We know there was a global flood because the Bible clearly teaches it as a factual event. To anyone well versed in logical fallacies, this is a clear example of circular reasoning. We know it's true because the Bible says it's true. It's like a Muslim saying, we know the prophet Muhammad was a messenger of the true God because the Quran teaches it as fact. Or a Hindu saying, we know that Lord Shiva brought his beheaded son back to life because the Vedas teaches it as a factual event. Actually, that is not an example of circular reasoning. He is getting at a right point that developments from that idea of it is true because the Bible believes it so, it is true because the Quran says it so, that can then lead to a, a fallacy of circular reasoning. But the reality is just saying it is true because the Bible says it so is not itself a form of circular reasoning. I'm sure that's not what he's intending. I'll give him a charitable interpretation. But what circular reasoning is, is saying A is true because of B, and then B is true because of A, and then the circle goes around. For example, in his case, it is true because the Bible says it's true. Why is the Bible true? Because the Bible says it's true. That is circular reasoning. However, if I said the Bible, it is true because the Bible says it's true. The Bible is true because of the strong historical evidence supporting 90% of all the genres interpreted correctly within it. Then, well, by inductive reasoning, the rest of the 10% is most likely true as well. That is the same start starting sentence as it is true because the Bible says it's true, but it is not a case of circular reasoning. Though I think we both understand what he's getting at. He is probably just saying, well, it is circular reasoning if and when people say it is true because the Bible says it's true. The Bible says it's true because the Bible is true. Then that would, of course, be circular reasoning. How can so many flood legends exist that share such common features with the biblical one? As Noah's descendants spread throughout the earth, it seems that they retold the story of the flood. In time, however, the story evidently became distorted into various forms. The first time I saw this, it kind of made sense, especially considering what happened at the Tower of Babel. Over time, the story was retold and retold until it got distorted into various forms. But when I broke down the exact categories, the locations, and the details of these specific floods, that hypothesis began to fall apart. I first thought it was bizarre how Watchtower included the category destruction by water. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've never seen a major flood that hasn't brought some level of destruction by water. This would be the equivalent of me doing a table to find humans similar to myself and including the box human. One aspect that was more surprising to me, though, was that only half of these flood legends were of divine cause. Considering how in the biblical account, God warns Noah, God provides the specific building dimensions of the ark, God brings the animals, God brings the rain, God shuts the door, God approves of Noah's post-flood sacrifices. God plays a massive role in this story. But in almost half of these legends found all over the world, a god or gods don't even feature. If this hypothesis was true, that the prevalence of flood legends derives from a singular event in Genesis, then we would expect these legends to exist irrespective of their location. You would find some on islands, some being told by people who live in a country which borders the sea, and some being told by people who live a thousand miles inland. 
But as you go through the list, one by one you notice that nearly all of these legends are from islands or countries which border the sea. And in the odd case, you think they're not. A small amount of research into the people in the tribes to which these flood legends derive reveal at one time they lived either by the sea or by major rivers. So that being said, you can actually notice genealogically that historically most people live by the sea. But actually, I would, I would like to make it very clear that I'm not going to be responding necessarily to whether Noah's Ark is historically true or not, because I think that goes down a very big rabbit hole, which I personally don't really bother about, nor do I really care about. Um, I follow a tradition, a very long church tradition from Origen to Augustine, as I've noted before, that certain elements of the Bible can be interpreted as true and valid and infallible without it being necessarily historically true. This is something which predates any of these modern scientific data or modern scientific evidence, which would then counter or respond to the claim that, oh, the Christians are only changing their perspective because of modern developments in science. Hold up, that is actually not true. That is just com a complete distortion of the facts. Christians, since the early church in th third century AD, have already recognized that certain parts of the text, even Genesis itself, are not meant to be taken completely as historical fact, but for their allegorical truth. So you can see that pr prior to all these modern scientific hypotheses, before anyone would have the resources that the truth hurts has to actually understand or criticize or critique or understand or criticize the historicity of the text themselves, they've already developed allegorical readings, which then sheds more light on the hypothesis and gives more credence to the idea that these texts do not need to be interpreted historically as accurate to have their same infallible authority over Christians today. Because ultimately, if the only reason that you think or the atheist thinks that we're changing our view is because of science, but then we realize or you notice historically that Christians have changed their view prior to the development of the science that they suggest, then it goes to show that the Bible can be interpreted without this kind of historical, um, kind of historical, what's the best word for it, conservatism or literalism that a lot of people like to present. Now, of course, when Harrison or the truth or it's just talking about, he is responding to Jehovah's Witnesses and maybe Jehovah's Witnesses has that hardline approach on the veracity of scripture. So maybe his arguments will hold against such a literal interpretation of scripture. But at the same time, I would like to say, well, that is not the only Christian position that needs to be. In fact, there are more nuanced and more developed arguments out there. So as a result, this literalist versus atheist is a complete false dichotomy presented by Harrison. So anything which he says that, OK, the story that disproves the entire Bible, if it's even if it's not histor historical, it does not disprove the entire Bible. It's a tradition which goes way beyond and before that as well. Can we say that every single earthquake legend around the world is derived from the Bible's viewpoint? That, that is not an earthquake legend in the Bible. He just says he moves mountains without that. That's taken completely out of context. And those are all completely um, taken out of context. These are not earthquake legends, just as God has ability to do these things, which if you believe in an omnipotent God, yeah, that kind of follows. It says, it's kind of like saying, Josh can lift up his phone if he wanted to. That's not exactly a phone lifting legend. It's just saying he has the power to do it. Because when I went to see a couple in the family and I told them that the story of Noah's Ark was one of the key reasons as to why I was having doubts in my faith, they looked at me completely bemused and they said, well, well, has, has what do you mean? They have found Noah's Ark. Yeah, I found Noah's Ark as well. Ken Ham built it in America or something, right? I mean, that's that's good proof of the historical uh, truth of Noah's Ark. After Noah reached 500 years of age, he became father to Shem, Ham, and Japheth. This was the first red flag that I encountered, and it's before the flood story even begins. If I wanted to maintain my belief that this story was true, I'd also have to believe that in a world before contraception, in a world in which Noah and his wife probably got married as soon as their bodies were physically able to, they were having intimate moments for around 480 years without bearing a child. And then bam, there's three all at once. Mentally, that didn't quite sit right. It didn't make sense. And so I asked a family member that I respected for their opinion. They said that because Noah was closer to Adam's perfection, he probably had greater control of his reproductive powers. Now, actually, I would say that this is a wrong interpretation of the thing. There are situations in the Bible where it would say Noah has or someone has these sons. It doesn't mean that he only had these sons. It was just that those sons were crucial to the story. It's kind of like if I was my friend, my friend had like six kids and, and then I was telling a story about my friend and his kids. I will not name all his six kids. I'll only name the kids who were useful to the story as a whole.
instead of just saying, okay, his first son's name was Ad, and the next one was Jeff, the next one was Ed, and the next one was um, Josh, the next one was Jake, the next one was, you just say, well, okay, this guy has has these kids, Jeff, my the, my friend Aaron went to to fishing with his with Jeff, Jake, and John, his sons, and they went fishing. I wouldn't say that he had extra three sons because they weren't vital to the story, but it doesn't necessarily mean there was no other three sons as well. When I consider this point, it impacted the story of Noah's Ark the same way an iceberg impacted the story of the Titanic. But with those who are so determined to believe it, such as Christians, where there's a will to make something believable, there's a way to make something believable. And this is another point where I think he's completely uncharitable. I've made it quite clear, and we all know that it's quite clear that there is a very long line of non-literal interpretation of scriptures. And I've said this quite a few times throughout the Bible, but I think it's an important point to hammer in when we're talking to Harrison in this, in this situation, because, well, he's like, okay, well, if there's a way to make something believable, then, well, if there's a will to make something believable, there's a way to make something believable. And, oh, these Christians are forcefully trying to make something provable. That's just not the case, really. A lot of Christians are looking at Noah's Ark and looking at these events and saying, hey, look, non-literal interpretations of the Bible exist as historical fact throughout history. And let us just take those with more seriousness and let's understand it. It's not all Christians. You cannot put all Christians in a single box. And to, not, and to fall out of that box of literal interpretation of scriptures you don't exactly stop being a Christian, nor are you being unfaithful, because as I've said, you're not responding to science. You're joining a tradition which predates all these modern developments in science. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind. And I think that Harris is perhaps only attacking a certain group of Christians, which, to be honest, I may agree with them on some points and disagree with them on some points, but they're definitely not responsible or representative of the entire Bible or the entire group of Christians as such. Geologists and archaeologists have found convincing evidence that there was a flood here up to 22 feet in height around the year 2900 BC, centered on the city of Shurapak. Needless to say that many humans could have died. Many animals could have died. But for royalty or those in high places who have access to a boat, they, along with their own personal menagerie of animals, could have survived. Now safely atop the floodwaters, where was the one place within a relative close proximity to them, which they'd either visited in person or heard about, which would not be impacted in any way by these floodwaters? To a biblical literalist, they will say, don't talk such nonsense. If this book says it was a global flood, it was a global flood. If this book says that the Ark finished its voyage on Mount Ararat in Turkey, then that's what happened. This book does not lie. Well, fortunately, we live in a time period where we don't have to take any one person's word that the story is true. We don't even have to take the Bible at face value because there is a foolproof method of determining whether the story is historically sound. What we can do is we can analyse the geographical dispersity of animal species across the entire planet. In theory, the closer you get to Mount Ararat in Turkey and huh? surrounding... I'm confused. I mean, he just said that, OK, there's, there's more than one way to interpret it. Well, fortunately, we live in a time period where we don't have to take any one person's word that the story is true. I was back into this. I mean, it'll be interesting to see how he would approach different interpretations of scriptures, because he seems to be very, very much criticizing only one certain tiny group of Christians or one part of the Christian community instead of the whole one, and then viewing that as representative of the entirety of the Christian scriptures. I want to make it very clear that this video is not an argument for or against whether the, Bible, the Noah's Ark is historically true or not. I have no kind of no, no saying on that, I don't really mind what you believe in that. But in some sense, I I, 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 I must f say that I feel somewhat bad for Harrison. I, I And I don't want to sound like I'm pitying him or anything like that, because that's not a good thing that I want to be promoting here, because I don't want to pity anyone. But he must have had some horrible experiences with Christians in the past to make him just so targeted against that one type of Christians, because it's quite clear if you, if you actually do any research that the Christian community is way more diverse than that. And there's way more interpretation of scripture, which equally holds strong views and strong presentations of Christianity, which are all theologically and philosophically and and faithfully sound to to the scriptures. So I think it's very important that you open your minds. Now, I'm, I'm very curious what, what he would think about if he actually looks at that kind of wide range of different interpretation of Christianity and see how he really interacts with them, because I think there would be a lot of differences there. The more questions you ask regarding this story's historicity, the more you receive the resounding answer, it's not true. Organisations like Jehovah's Witnesses are fully aware of this fact. They know just how minimal and how desperate any evidence is in support of this story being possible, let alone true. They know that if one of their members attempts to isolate and examine this story's historicity, it could lead to their entire tower of faith crumbling to the floor and them leaving the organisation. And so what do they do? Well, they have one final trick stored up their sleeve. Look, if someone is really going to leave Christianity because they found one element of the Bible is not historically true, you know, it's a sad thing to see, 
but perhaps it really understands or illustrates kind of what is fundamentally the essence of their faith. If you're going to make a faith based on a certain scripture or a certain idea and a certain interpretation of scripture, then, well, that faith is not based in the right place because ultimately Christianity is a relationship with a God which loves us and not a relationship with an impartial book which exists. Of course, that book is important, understanding God, but it is not first with the book, then with God, but rather with God first and then the book. So when we're thinking about, well, OK, what are valid reasons? And of course, I don't want to say valid reasons because everyone has a valid reason to act in the way they do based on their own interpretation. But if you're going to be so strong in your own interpretation to the Bible and say that's the only intervention I would possibly accept without any understanding of the historical context of it, then, well, you've made your own interpretation your God. You've become idolizing your own interpretation, which is not a Christian idea to start with at the first place. Jesus, Paul and Peter accepted the flood as historical and used it as a warning. Jesus Christ plainly stated, Noah entered into the ark and the flood arrived. This is the best evidence possible. Jesus was in heaven before he came to earth. He watched the building of the ark. He saw the flood. When considered from that standpoint, the evidence that Noah's ark existed is already overwhelming. Or as my dad put it, are you calling Jesus Christ a liar? To an indoctrinated mind, this diversion method works to absolute perfection. Just like a magician who diverts the audience's attention from what's really going on, they attempt to divert the attention away from Noah's Ark and proving whether it's true or not, to Jesus Christ, a being who gave up his exalted position in heaven and suffered a truly agonising death so that they could receive everlasting life. They are reminding you that if you question the flood story, you are inadvertently questioning Jesus Christ himself. How dare you? Unfortunately for the organisation, this line of reasoning produced the exact opposite reaction within me. I had spent 25 years of my life going door to door preaching and teaching that this book isn't just the inspired word of God, but the infallible word of God. When it touches on science or history, it is always 100% accurate, guaranteed. And yet as one of the foundation pieces of this book, there is quite a fallacious story, an obvious mythological adaptation. Not using fallacious in the right way. Sorry, I'm being pedantic. I am an Oxford uh philosophy theology student he's not using fallacious in the correct way there though i would like to point talk about the idea of jesus because that's an important thing right there there is no matter how far you go an element where certain parts of the text are literal and has to be interpreted literally now if that's the case well what could jesus have meant when he says just in the day in the days just as it was in the days of noah luke 17 26 27 right um that's what he's talking about well the reality is there's lots of ways you can look at it for example he is talking about the perspective through which he interprets the world or through the perspective through which everyone else interprets the world. Or he's talking allegorically. For example, if I said, just as it was in Lord of the Rings, the enemy army in history surrounded this castle and um, blew it up or whatever it was, right? You could say, well, okay, I'm using just as it was as a way to present an allegory to just demonstrate that kind of allegorical or analogical relationship between the two ideas. Likewise, he could mean it real. That's another way to interpret it. Or he is talking from the perspective of the people he was talking to. For example, when he says this is the smallest seed in the world, he's not literally saying this is the smallest seed in the world. He's saying this is the smallest seed that, you know, if, even if you have faith the size of this seed, then, well, you'll be able to move mountains. Well, obviously, there are other seeds which may be smaller. But look, if, if, if Jesus was going to raise a seed that no one knew about, people would be like, what are you on about? Not only would he not have a demonstration in his hands or a way to direct to someone people conceived, if he was talking to a group of Israelites at that time about the smallest seed in the middle of the Amazon rainforest, well, obviously, no one will understand what he's talking about, right? So it's important that to understand when you're teaching, and this is a method of teaching and public speaking as well, that when you're talking, you're talking in a lens that people can understand you. And as a result, when you're interpreting the Bible, it's very important to have kind of those, those, those perspectives, those different approaches to the Bible all mixed together to understand in the depth what truly is being said by the Bible. Sometimes trying to push something too literally, it's just completely missing the point of the whole story at large. The fact that the rest of the Bible, including apparently the words of Jesus Christ himself, refer to this story as being true, simply disproves my claim that it is inspired and infallible. In other words, my whole tower of faith did this. Since leaving the organisation, I've come to learn of two people who spoke to my dad on different occasions about this story. I repeatedly asked my dad to examine the evidence for this story with an open mind. After my disassociation, another family member took up the mantle and highlighted this story as one of the reasons why they had had doubts and why they had left the religion. Despite being beaten around the head from all angles by this quite obviously untrue and plagiarised story, my dad still refuses to assess the evidence for it with an open mind. 
Like him, masses of people around the globe desire to remain in ignorance of science and history, preferring instead to gulp down a holy book like it's Kool-Aid. I'll highly recommend him to read church literature, and I'll end off this this response video with this. It's like, if you read church history, understand church tradition, you understand that it's not people not uh, following literal interpretations. It's not about this idea of responding to science or being ignorant of science at all. Christians are not ignorant of science. Christi Christianity has developed prior to science and have developed the changes prior to science for non-literal interpretation of scripture. So science has nothing to do with the proper interpretation of scripture. You can have a proper interpretation of scripture without that reliance on science that he seems to completely miss. And I'm not sure why he hasn't read that yet or, or has studied the church tradition for it. Perhaps that's not his area of interest, fair enough. But I hope people watching this video and then watching this video would be able to see that that difference of perspective and the understanding that even if Noah's art is not historically true, it doesn't disprove the Bible at all. In fact, it just does nothing to do the Bible as at all as a structure just because of the long depth of history and tradition behind it. Now, for those who are biblical literalists and are watching this video wanting a response to it, I'm sorry you're disappointed, but well, you can go do your own research about what you think is the right way. You can turn to the resources I've talked about for non-literal interpretation of scripture. Do whatever you want with the information provided here. My response here is purely to respond to the claim that the Noah's Ark disproves the entire Bible, which, as I've demonstrated within this video, via history, tradition, church, understanding, theological, and philosophical reasoning, demonstrated that the Noah's Ark story clearly does not disprove the Bible. Hope you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments what other videos you want me to respond to. I do want to make more response videos in the future. You seem to like it. Stay safe. See you soon. Thank you for watching and goodbye. I'll see you next one.